Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service of Holy Communion on this first Sunday of the new year. So a very happy new year to you all. Uh, we're broadcasting today from St. John's Carterton for the congregations of St. Britius Bryce Norton and St. John's Carterton, and indeed for, uh, for friends who are watching uh, in other places and for church members who are listening on the telephone. Uh, a very warm welcome and a very happy new year to everyone. We're observing today as Epiphany Sunday. Epiphany is actually January the 6th, and it's become the custom to celebrate the Epiphany on the Sunday nearest, and that's what we're doing today. The season of Epiphany, Epiphany means revealing, manifesting. Um, it's about Jesus being revealed, and there are three ways the church remembers that. First of all, um, he is revealed to those outside Israel as the Magi come to Bethlehem. Uh, he's revealed as the Messiah at his baptism when the, uh, the Holy Spirit comes on him like a dove. And he's revealed at the wedding in Cana of Galilee where he turns water into wine as the creator God who will also make a new creation. So those are the epiphany themes and uh, we'll be looking at those during uh, the course of the next week or so. We have... Well, I can just find it. Here we are. We have a, a suggestion for you this year that you might like to um, read through the New Testament with us using uh, this order of readings. Um, a lot of you have seen it already by email, but there are paper copies. And if you'd like a paper copy, please do let us know and we'll make sure one gets to you. I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in the notices at the end of the service. So we come to our worship for today around the Lord's table. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Our worship begins then with the hymn, Brightest and Best of the Sons of the Morning, and Mike and Linda Cox will lead us in this. Thanks very much, Mike and Linda. 
as our worship continues. Let's ask God to bless our worship with his Holy Spirit um, as we pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. The grace of God has dawned upon the world through our Savior Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself for us to purify a people as his own. As we often do, let's just pause for a moment now before we say a prayer of confession. And in a couple of moments of quiet, allow God the Holy Spirit to remind us of anything that we should be saying sorry to our Father God for today. So with confidence now, let us confess our sins as we say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The scripture says that when God's people come in penitence, he takes away our sins. He removes them as far as the east is from the west. And so we rejoice in that truth as we worship God together in the words of the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And the collect, the special prayer of this Sunday, let's pray this together. Creator of the heavens, who led the Magi by a star to worship the Christ child, guide and sustain us that we may find our journey's end in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So we come to our first Bible reading, which Paddy has recorded for us. This Sunday's reading is taken from... Uh, the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 to 13. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, 
according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses according to the richness of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. As a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope in Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Thank you, Paddy. We come now to another great Epiphany Tide hymn, As with Gladness, Men of Old, led for us by Reverend Ian. Thank you, Ian. Now, Ray has our gospel reading for us, and that will be followed immediately by the sermon which Gary has for us. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. We hear Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, 
Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. Well, great to be here this morning. It's a privilege to be able to preach the first Sunday of this new year. And I think the, the words in Ephesians are particularly relevant for us. I'm just going to pray briefly before I start. Father God, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you want to speak to us. And we ask that you would speak to us this morning. We pray that your word would go forward and achieve the purpose for which you want it to, that we might meet with you and that we might be changed so that we're more like you as a result. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you probably know, but Paul divided his letter to the Ephesians into two clear segments. The first part was, or the first half, was about our relationship to God through Christ. And the second half is about our relationship to other people. So the first half, Paul shows us how we can be put right with God, how we can come to God by faith through grace. And then the second half shows us how we should behave once we're believers. Paul starts his letter to the Ephesians by reminding them what Jesus has done for them. He reminds them of the tremendous blessings they have in Jesus. And in the reading, Ephesians 1, 3 to 4, 4 14, Paul starts by getting the church's focus back on Jesus, where it needs to be before he goes on to talk about how they should live, how they should worship, how they should treat each other. He refocuses them on Jesus by pointing out the tremendous blessings that they have in him. Verse 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So this first Sunday of 2021, I'd like us to refocus on Jesus. Let's see the blessings that God has given us in him. And so when we finish this service, when we go out from the church or the home, we can go praising him. Now, there's four blessings God has given his church in Jesus. I want to pick out from this passage. Firstly, verses three to six shows us that God has a plan for the church 
in Christ. Have you ever worked on a project or been in an organization where the leader who was in charge hadn't got a clue what they were doing? I mean, I have, unfortunately. It's frustrating and dismal to work in that kind of environment. Somebody said there are four bones in any organization. The wish bones, those wishing that somebody else would do the work. The jaw bones, those that do all the talking, but very little else. The knuckle bones, those that knock everything. And the back bones, those who carry out the load and the brunt of the work. But it's a great blessing to be part of something that is organized and well planned. And we're part of an organization, the church, God's people, that God has had a plan for since before the beginning of time. And his plan has always been to bless us. When Paul wrote this, he was in Rome. So he wasn't particularly thinking about material blessings. but He was thinking about spiritual blessings. And the amazing thing is that God planned these blessings before he made the world. Verse 4 says that God chose us in Jesus before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And that word holy, it just simply means to be set apart. But that verse 4, you can, I don't think you can understand it with your head. I think we need to get it into our spirits, ask the Holy Spirit to to bring it into our spirit so that our spirit comes alive with that truth. Just think about it for a second. Before God made the world, he chose you and me to belong to him. Now, we hadn't even been born. Hundreds of years, thousands of years before we were born. However long it is, God created the world, but he chose us. And that is an amazing thought. And he planned that we would live free from the bondage and the fear, and the trap of sin. Not because he had to, not out of obligation, but because he loves us. Why did God choose Israel? We don't know, apart from one scripture in in Deuteronomy, where it says that I loved you because I loved you. I chose you because I loved you. That's the only reason. And why has God chosen us? Because he loves us. And another amazing blessing is in verse 5, where it says, In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons or his children through Jesus, in accordance with his pleasure and his will. Again, God chose us to belong to him. We give him pleasure. It was his plan. Nothing was in us that persuaded him to choose us. We couldn't earn that. But before he made the word, he chose us. That was his plan all along to take us as rebellious, sinful people and adopt us as his children through the blood of Christ. God plans to bless us by making us holy and by making us his sons. That's a tremendous thing. Number two, in verse 7 to 10, God makes provision for us, for his church in Christ. So before God created the world, he knew his creation would rebel against him. Now think about this for a minute. Jackie and I have six wonderful kids that we love and we wouldn't swap for anything. But just imagine that there's a young couple and it would reveal to them that if they had a child, that child would grow up, would insult them, abuse them, reject them, curse them, and even kill them. What would they do? Would they still have that child? Or would they get the best birth control available? God knew his creation would rebel. He knew we would put his son to death on the cross, yet he loved us enough to create us anyway. He loved us not only to create us, but when we rebelled, provided a way to restore our relationship with him. The word redeemed means that God brought us back from the power of sin into a relationship with him. And that provision cost Jesus everything, didn't it? It cost him his life. Philippians 2, 
Paul puts it like this, that Jesus emptied himself. He temporarily gave up his power and his position in heaven. And we've been thinking about that, haven't we, recently at Christmas. And he came to live on the earth for 33 years. He was rejected, abused, mocked, ridiculed, eventually killed. And he did it to make provision for us. As verse 7 says, so that we might have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Number three, verses 11 to 12, God fulfills a purpose for his church in Jesus. Now, there's a lot of talk today, isn't there, about purpose, finding our purpose. What's my purpose? People want to know what their purpose is in life. And the last part of the 20th century, the quest for most people seemed to be to get a nice house, a couple of cars, and lots of stuff, lots of material possessions. But we found out it wasn't enough. When we had enough, we wanted a bit more. At the peak of his wealth, John D. Rockefeller had a net worth of about 1% on his own of the entire American economy. He owned 90% of all the oil and gas industry when he was alive. He was asked how much money is enough. He said, just a little bit more. Terrible thing to say, really, when you've got all that. But it shows that wealth will never give us a sense of purpose. Remember, our inheritance is a, is a spiritual one. It's in Jesus. Verse 11 says, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. And there's that, that dual thing of predestination, God choosing us, and then that free will, us making that decision to follow God. And theologians have argued about that for ages. Somebody once asked Spurgeon how he, the, how he reconciled this idea of predestination and the sovereignty of God to the idea that man has free will to choose his eternal destination. He said this, I see no reason, no need to reconcile between friends. In other words, he was saying that the Bible teaches that God is sovereign. The Bible teaches that man is also responsible for, for his actions. And we're responsible to act according to God's will. Because God is in control, we're responsible to obey him. Our purpose is to obey him even when it makes us feel uncomfortable, even when it's difficult, sometimes even when we perhaps don't understand it. But discipleship is all about letting every part of our life come under the control of Jesus, come under the Lordship of Christ. But there's a temptation that we compartmentalize our lives. We're good at doing that in the West. So, for example, we think, well, Sunday morning, that's church, that belongs to God. When I go to house group, that's God's bit. When I read the Bible and pray in the day, that's God. But what about when I'm out fishing or going to the pub or playing rugby or watching a football on the telly, when I'm eating my tea, when I'm going to work, what about that? That's mine. But the fact is that God wants all of our lives to be under the Lordship of Christ. Hebrew thought and biblical thought isn't this splitting up of our lives, that we're unified, spirit, soul, and body. And it's important that we keep our lives together so that we don't compartmentalize them, so that different parts are separate so they don't affect one another. One afternoon, a man and his lady, um, it was with him in the driver's seat, went to a KFC drive through and they ordered a couple of chicken dinners. So the KFC employee gave them a bag and they drove off. They got to the picnic place and got out of the car, put the blanket down, got the food out, except it wasn't the chicken dinners. The chap had given them the day's takings in a bag that looked like the chicken dinner bag. What did they do? What would you do? Well, they packed up the picnic blanket, got back in the car, drove back to the drive through 
By this time, the owner, the manager, had realized that the money had gone, and he was apoplectic. He was pulling his hair out, going mad. And then he sees this couple come in with his bag, and they go up to him, and the man says, we've come to return this money. And this manager, he hugs them. He said, you are amazing. What a couple. I've never met anybody like you. You are so honest and so full of integrity. I'm going to call the papers down now, and they can come and take your picture, the two of you, with this bag of money to show everybody how honest you are. And this chap says, oh, no, we, we don't want any fuss. Don't do that. The manager goes, I insist, I insist. You must have your picture taken so everyone can see what you're like. And the man got close to the restaurant owner. This was obviously before COVID. And he said, I can't have my picture taken in the paper because the lady I'm with is married to somebody else. <laughs> I hope you like that one. But an illustration of how our lives can be compartmentalized. It's easy to be inconsistent and end up compartmentalizing things by obeying Jesus and letting him be Lord of some things, but not others. But God's purpose is for all of our lives to be under his control. Romans 8.29 is an incredible verse, and it tells us what God's purpose for us is. Paul says that God's will is that we're to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. And obedience to the Lord is cooperating with that purpose. God wants us, each of us, to come more and more like Jesus. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 3.18, I think it is, that um, we're being changed from one degree of glory into another. That's what holiness is about, being set apart for Jesus and becoming more like him so that our lives reflect him to our families, our friends, our communities. Verse 12, Ephesians 1 says that we might be to his praise and glory. See, it's not about us. Salvation is about God. It's about bringing glory and honor to him who saved us. That's our purpose, to be someone that reflects Jesus to others. Okay, finally then, number four. Verse 13 and 14, God keeps a promise for his church in Christ. When God blesses us with all these spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, he seals us. He seals this blessing with the Holy Spirit. He seals us. Now, for hundreds of years before Paul wrote this letter, that's what kings did. They sealed their decrees with a wax seal and pressed something into it. And this seal of the king I'd signified four things. Firstly, it signified security. When the king placed his seal on a document, it couldn't be broken. Even the king couldn't change it. And that's what we pick up in the story of Daniel, when King Darius couldn't change the rule he'd made. He'd been tricked into making. Secondly, it signified authority. Everyone who saw that seal knew instantly that the decree was from the king. It carried his authority. It was unique to him. Thirdly, it signified ownership. The king placed a seal on the decree. It showed people who it belonged to. So he'd use a seal to mark deeds of property and land and so on. And it belonged to him forever. And finally, it signified authority. A decree with a king's seal on it was as good as if the king himself was standing there commanding it. That's the kind of seal Paul has in mind when he wrote in verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of salvation. When you believed, you were marked with him, with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Just like the king's seal, Paul was thinking about God's seal being one of a kind. It's his personal seal. And the Holy Spirit in you and me, cannot be broken. It cannot be violated or revoked. The Holy Spirit seal means we belong to the king. We're his possession, and as his possession, we should say and do things that represent him in a good way. When we do represent him, when we speak his word, we speak it with the same authority as if it came from his very own mouth. 
That's why it's good to pray prayers that are in the Bible. If you're not sure what to pray for somebody, just pray Ephesians 3, 16 to 20, where it says, Paul prays that they may know how high and long and wide and deep is the love of God. That's a great prayer for anybody. Not only does God bless us with a seal of the Holy Spirit of promise, he blesses us with the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. That guarantee is that we're saved by the blood of Jesus, sealed by his Holy Spirit. And God guarantees us a place for him, with him, in heaven. Paul put it this way, Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ. God will finish what he starts. He's promised it. He's sealed it with the Holy Spirit. He's guaranteed it. Not for our glory, but for his glory. So, at the start of 2021, let's put our focus on Jesus this morning. Let's praise him for these blessings that he's given us in Christ. We can praise him for his plan for us in Jesus, his provision for us in Jesus, his purpose for us in Jesus, and his promise for us in Jesus. He has a plan, a purpose, a promise, and a provision for you in Jesus today. Amen. Thank you, Gary. Let's respond to God's word now as we declare our faith. Let us declare our faith in God. We say together, we believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now Steve's going to lead our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Let us begin 2021 by focusing on God's many blessings, spending time together in prayer whenever we can, and by being thankful for all the good things in our lives. We pray for our clergy team, Drew, Ian, Lindsay, Billy, Stephen, and Gary. Be with all of them as they continue in their ministries during these difficult times. Foremost in our minds is our rector, Drew, who is still awaiting his heart operation. Although there are other pressures in the hospital, we pray that this week the surgeons may be available and that the ICU beds are ready. Lord, be with the medical teams as they give Drew the surgery and care that he needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We all know the sufferings caused by the COVID-19 virus, and we think of those that may be struggling with the tier four restrictions especially those with mental health problems. We pray for all of the medical teams who've been working endlessly throughout the pandemic and continue to show commitments and dedication well beyond what would have been expected. We pray for all the NHS, the care homes and other medical agencies. Thank you for the great progress with the vaccinations that will help fight the coronavirus pandemic. We pray that the vaccinations will be administered as speedily as possible and that those most in need are given the early opportunity to get their lives back to some form of normality. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We think of all those who have lost loved ones recently and may their faith in you help them in their grieving. At this time of year, almost everyone who has lost a loved one feels their loss more deeply. Whether in the recent or distant past, losses can be felt acutely and painfully at special occasions like Christmas. 
May special memories help to sustain us all at these times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those personnel at RAF Bryce Norton who are continuing to work as best they can under the current restrictions. We also pray for all the military personnel who have been assigned to help the NHS in the delivery of the vaccinations, and also for those who are still helping at the coronavirus testing centres throughout the country. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the children prepare to go back to school this week, we pray that they will be in a safe environment and the best measures are taken to reduce the risk of spreading the coronavirus. We pray for all the teachers and teaching assistants who'll be working in that high risk environment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, let us not forget those who are not blessed with the same comforts that we are all able to enjoy. We think of the homeless in Oxford and those within our local communities who, especially at times like this, must rely on the good work of the Beeson in Whitney, the Gatehouse in Oxford and other charitable organisations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we start this new year, we may struggle with fear and worry, but help our strength, our faith to be strengthened and our hearts and minds filled with hope. May our darker days be brightened by remembering that Jesus truly is the light of our world. Let us go out refreshed in a renewed spirit, in the full confidence that you will be with everyone, wherever we are, at work or at home, and praising God's glory. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Steve. And so we come to the peace, wherever you are watching or listening, um, whether you're with others or perhaps on your own, uh, join in this um, act of sharing the peace spiritually and have in mind all those you care about uh, as we share peace together. Our Saviour, Jesus Christ, is the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. The peace of the Lord be always with you. be with you. Now uh, we're going to continue in worship with the song from the squalor of a borrowed stable which Louise will lead for us. the kids. 
Faces of a friend's betrayal He was lifted on a cruel cross He was punished for a world's transgressions He was suffering to save the lost He fights for breath from the claims of hell and with a shout our souls are free death defeated by Emmanuel now he's standing in the place of honor crowned with glory on the Interceding for his own beloved Till his father calls to bring them home Then the skies will part as the trumpet sounds Hope of heaven or the fear of hell But the bride will run to her lover's arms Giving glory to Emmanuel Thank you, Louise. We're going to say our offering prayer now. Can I just say thank you to all of you who are continuing to support the life and work of the church in both parishes through your giving behind the scenes. Uh, let's offer that to the Lord in every way in which all sorts of people uh, in these difficult days are giving service to the Lord. Let's say together. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord is here. Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. All honor and praise be yours always and everywhere, mighty creator, ever-living God, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. For at this time we celebrate your glory made present in our midst. In the coming of the Magi, the King of the world was revealed to the nations. In the waters of baptism, Jesus was revealed as the Christ, the Savior sent to redeem us. In the water made wine, the new creation was revealed at the wedding feast. Poverty was turned to riches, sorrow into joy. Therefore, with all the angels of heaven, we lift our voices to proclaim the glory of your name and sing our joyful hymn of praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favor on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. In heart and mind today, eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And so let's pray together. We do not presume to come to this, your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. The body and blood of Christ keep you, <coughs> you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. 
have a song now which uh, Drew recorded uh, a little while ago. Um, it's really good to have him contributing to uh, to this service. As you've already heard, as Steve said in our prayers, Drew is waiting for an operation we hope this week. So please do keep him very much in your prayers for the whole situation, for surgeons, uh, for beds available, and for Drew and Billy um, in having to wait as they do. Uh, but let's now let Drew lead us in worship. Open the eyes of my heart. you. And now let's pray together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring give life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory, and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, and remain with you always. Amen. Our final song today, Mike and Linda again are going to lead us in Thou Who Was Rich Beyond All Splendor.
thank you, Mike and Linda. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. I did say that uh, before we finish, I'd uh, share a, a couple of notices. I think the first thing to say is that, um, as you will have appreciated, we're now doing our services online only. Uh, in Tier 4, it could be allowed to assemble in church, but we've taken the decision that given rising case numbers um, across the country, and not least where we are, for your safety, um, we would prefer to do things online and on the telephone. So I hope you'll understand that and join with us as much as you can in the next few weeks until things develop and we hopefully and prayerfully will be able to get back together again. I did say, uh, I would say just a, a brief word about our New Testament reading plan, um, which, as I say, some of you have seen online already, and there are some paper copies here. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I've been in church this morning. Um, someone said to me, you do realize there's a misprint on the front cover. It says Bible verse for 2020. Now, if I was Captain Mannering, I would, of course, have replied, well done, men. I wonder who'd spot that first. But I'm not, and I didn't. <laughs> Apologies, it should read 2021. Uh, if you would like us to get a copy, a paper copy to you, we've got plenty here, do let us know, please. And it is also available um, as uh, a PDF file on email. The readings for this first period um, between uh, now and next Saturday are in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 1 to 7. And just let me allow me, if you will, just a little brief comment on what's there. We've got Matthew chapter 1, the most boring passage in the entire New Testament, the genealogies, so-and-so was the father of so-and-so, and so-and-so was the father of so-and-so. If you're reading it, don't skip over that. Try and pick out some of the names you recognize. What are they doing there? Who are they? Look out for some of the women who are there. Why are they there? What Matthew is trying to do is to show that Jesus is the legitimate king of Israel. He is actually in the royal family's family tree. He has the right to be the king, not only of Israel, but of the world. Uh, then Matthew goes on to show that Jesus fulfills Old Testament prophecy. He's Emmanuel. Isaiah 7 talked about Emmanuel. He was born in Bethlehem. Micah 5 talks about Bethlehem. He was recalled from Egypt. Hosea 11 talks about that. He's called a Nazarene. A little more complicated, that one. He is a, 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 the nets there with the shoots, the shoots from the family of, of, of David. Uh, that's in Isaiah 11. And he's light in the darkness, Isaiah 9. And then towards the end of the week, we go into the Sermon on the Mount. Um, the trouble with the Sermon on the Mount is sometimes we can treat it like a list of do's and don'ts. You know, you must do this and you mustn't do that. You mustn't do this. And it becomes like a set of laws and rules we've got to make, we've got to obey. Actually, what Jesus is really intending there is to give a snapshot or a series of snapshots. What does it look like when people who love Jesus are living with him as their king? It looks like this, and it looks like this, and it looks like this. The Sermon on the Mount is a series of, of snapshots of what it looks like. So do uh, have a look at that with us. And can I just say that if, as we go through the New Testament, and, and you'd like to be part of this, if you come to a passage and you think to yourself, what on earth does that mean? Don't just sit there worrying about it or ignoring it. Get in touch with us. Let's get a discussion going. It would be lovely to have, uh, whether it's on the phone or perhaps by email, it would be lovely just to have some conversations about what we're reading uh, and what God is saying to us through these scriptures. So there you go. 2021, not 2020. I think we've seen enough of 2020 to last us for quite a long time. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you to all my colleagues who've been here in church uh, putting the service together and to those who've recorded their contributions. God bless you all.